It is my absolute pleasure to be able to introduce John Emerson. And he and Beck are going to be working with you individually a lot over the next course of the next few days. And um, you will be able to use his expertise to help you narrow the focus. I'm stealing his thunder. The guy is a god among men. <laughs> From Brooklyn. He is the founder, I forgot this, the founder, see, I could have told you, founder of Backspace.com and our next speaker. So let me introduce to you, John Emerson. God among men. <laughs> thank you. Is on? Hello. All right. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me back. I, I was here last year and uh, had a grand old time. I think my cheeks have finally recovered from last night, uh, all the smiling. <laughs> so I, uh, I am a designer and programmer, and I live and work in Brooklyn. Uh, for the past 17 years, I've worked with a number of companies mostly media companies, large and small. Um, also, I, most of my clients these days are nonprofits focused on human rights. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about social media, and outreach, uh, marketing, and campaigning. This is me on Twitter, and I'll tell you why that's important uh, in a moment. So social media, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned. I'm going to start big and then kind of drill down to specifics. Uh, and just so you know my point of view, uh, I come from a very advocacy point of view. Uh, I, I work with my clients to try to create social change. So, uh, but first a confession. Uh, perhaps like many of you, I admit I was a social media skeptic. Uh, I have had a website online since 96, 97. Um, I had a, have been running a blog since 2002. I'd actually met the architects of Twitter uh, at, a, at a tech camp uh, long before Twitter even existed. And so when I first heard about Twitter or Facebook, I was like, yeah, okay, you know, I know Friendster, I know MySpace, what's the big deal? Friendster. 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 Does anyone know Friendster? Oh, it's ancient history now. So this was a, a social network uh, that existed before Facebook, um, people connecting to friends. Um, but as, as Facebook you know, starts to get those email invites, right, your friends, your family, you know, join, join me, so-and-so is on Facebook. I was like, okay, I'll sign up. People posting about you know, what they had for lunch, you know, how they're feeling that day. Okay, you know, I'm, I'm busy. Um, <laughs> But over the course of time, I started to, to see how the popularity grew. Uh, and it was very soon clear, well, soon, a couple of years, that this was not just a toy, but this was very much a tool, um, both a toy and a tool. And so you started to see things happening like this. This is a nine-year-old Martha Payne uh, from Scotland who decided to uh, take pictures of her school lunch every day and uh, documented basically just how, you know, from Annie Hall, the, the portions here, uh, was the food here is, is terrible. Yes, and the portions are too small. Well, this, we have both. Uh, and so she, her blog became very, very popular and started to spread among social media and soon became uh, a bit of a sensation. Uh, caught the attention of Jamie Oliver, uh, also known as the Naked Chef, a very big celebrity in the cooking, cooking show. Uh, in the UK, a number of cookbooks, and he's very active in trying to promote uh, more nutritious foods and school lunches. Um, when the, the school authorities saw Martha's blog and all that it was generating all this negative attention um, to, the, to the, their school system, they tried to shut it down. Jamie Oliver picked this up uh, and, and broadcast it to his many followers, uh, and this, this quickly uh, grew, uh, became uh, public campaign. In fact, uh, the National uh, Party of Scotland Education Secretary encouraged the district to reverse its policy banning photo, uh, cameras in schools so that uh, Martha could continue blogging. Uh, and the school ultimately changed its policies. Uh, and so now students can have unlimited salads uh, of fruits and vegetables with their lunch. 
was it's a huge success, and a lot of this happened on social media. So social media has become very much uh, not just a tool of fun and, and connection, but a, a municipal utility. If you want to know if, if the New York City schools are closed, don't bother going to the website. The website's terrible, and the one guy who probably updates it doesn't get in until 9. Um, you, you go on Twitter, and you see, is this a snow day or not? Um, and just to prove how much of an establishment social media has become, the Oxford English Dictionary has included the tweet in the social networking sense uh, in its, into its corpus uh, in only a mere seven and a half, six and a half years, breaking the rule that a word needs to be in circulation for 10 years before they add it. So this is extraordinary. Uh, so why social media? Well, that's where the audience is. This is a, a map, a cartogram rather, of uh, the most popular website visited per country. The, the countries are distorted based on the population. Uh, and the blue and green, orange and yellow are all, sorry, not yellow, uh, these are all the most, th these are all social media websites. And everywhere you see red, the second most popular website is undoubtedly blue. In the vast majority of countries, it's uh, Facebook. In some countries, there are, there are other social networks. A Pew study last year, just last fall, reported that 73% of online adults use social media. And Facebook re reports 1.23 billion monthly active users. There are only 7 billion people on the planet. This is astonishing. Now, some of these users may be uh, corporate persons. Um, so, you know, judge these numbers for yourself. Uh, but social media has become hugely popular because it's so easy. They make it very easy to, to connect, um, to connect with each other, make it very easy to discover contents, or sharing content. You, you all know this. Uh, and word of mouth is, is hugely influential. When I want to discover a new restaurant in my neighborhood, I don't, my first stop is not Yelp, it's not the New York Times, it's my friend Catherine. She's a foodie. She knows these things. She follows these things. And I trust her judgment. Um, word of mouth is hugely influential, much more so than advertising. In fact, there was a study that said, word of mouth influences museum goers 13 times more than conventional advertising. Uh, and going to museums is also a social activity. And we'll see more of that in a second. People don't go to see the latest exhibit as much as they go to see it with someone they care about. An important distinction. So social media is persuasive. Our friends are trusted. We trust our friends and family. And it's also incredibly fast. Now you can see breaking news as it happens. You have Ukrainian generals tweeting that the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, as the Russians are coming. In real time, this spreads uh, worldwide. In Turkey, it's become a municipal uh, utility, not just for the government to notify it, citizens, but for citizens to connect with each other. Um, and we're seeing huge uprisings there. So much so that the government has tried to ban Twitter. This is uh, Google's uh, DNS address spray painted on a poster of the, the governing party, providing a way for people to, to bypass the government's ban on Twitter. So what is social media made of? I put to you that social media is made of three things. The first thing, social media is made of people. <laughs> <laughs> and what are people made of? They're made of emotions, desires, fears, memories, knowledge, ideas. They have bodies, they have culture, perspective, identities. Number two. Social media is made of robots. And by robots, I mean code. And these are the rules that govern our interaction with social media. And these rules are patterns. These rules set the parameters of what we can do and how we do it. This is the, the interface. So what's become the convention is this what they call the river of news style, which is kind of a reverse chronological stream of information, the most recent at the top, other uh, information flowing below, People post to social media. This can be text, links, images, or videos. 
and Facebook has this other thing, events. And then you can respond to these things. You can reply, you can comment, you can reblog, you can like, you can favorite, you can share. And all of these actions, all of this information, all of these posts, it's all data that the robots are consuming and spreading around, filling our streams, quite literally in some cases, uh, and also generating metadata. When, when are these things posted? From where? From what type of device? And so your audience and your outreach is both people and robots. And I'll explain. But what do people want? Well, they like useful information. They like social connection. They like status, reassurance, catharsis, novelty, delight, growth, success, justice, self-determination, security, and the greatest thing, to love and be loved in return. <laughs> what do robots want? Well, they like their patterns. They like to create value for their operators. Um, what do both of them want? Well, they both want to do their thing, want to fulfill their function, want to fulfill their mission. The difference is, of course, that people get to write their own. And they want to do so with, with using the least amount of energy possible. Everything in the universe wants to use the least amount of energy possible, but especially people, <coughs> and especially robots. Um, and people, they also want to improve themselves. They want to grow. They want to improve their network and their community. In short, they want to level up. So what does it have to, you, have to do with you? Where is the best place to level up? Libraries. <laughs> So how do you connect what you have to offer with your target audience, with your communities, with the people on social media? How do you reach them? For me, this is the key question. Who? Everything else flows from this question. If, if you take, this is my one takeaway. You don't have to remember anything else I'm saying. It's who. So why who? Well, you want to know who they are, so you want to find out what makes them tick. You want to find out what they care about, what they're interested in. You want to find out what their point of view is. You want to start to try to build a profile of your audience. The idea being that you're not just notifying them about what you have to offer, but you want to grab their attention, and you want to make a connection. What kind of who are we talking about? So there's the basic demographics, which you probably already know, their income, their household status, where they live, um, what languages they speak. Once you know who they are, you know what language to produce your materials in. But also, what are their hopes? What are their interests? What are their fears? What are their identities? And after you know the who, or whom, <laughs> then you know the what. What kind of information are they, do they want? What motivates them? What are their influences? Once you know the who, then you can determine the where. And by where, I mean a couple of different things. Where are they physically? And also, uh, where are they looking? What networks are they using? Lots of people are on Facebook, but not everybody. Lots of people have smartphones, but not everybody. You need to know who. Just a few of the many, many, many social networks uh, Once you know their location, you can start to target them. Uh, on many social media networks, you can uh, buy ads that target uh, by, by geography. And it's very, very cost effective. But you only pay for the, the followers or the clicks. What media do they consume? And where do they consume it? This was spray painted on the road between the airport and Camp David uh, on the eve of the G8 summit. If you're trying to, if your audience, your target audience, this is from an advocacy context. If your target audience are the members of, of, the, of the G8, or the delegates going to this particular mm -hmm. meeting, you're not necessarily going to reach them on social media. Mm -hmm. But they are going to travel this road. So this was uh, spray painted uh, by the organization One.org, uh, which does a lot of anti-poverty work uh, in Africa. They do wonderful, well, actually, now it should be the G7, as I read just on Twitter this morning that <laughs> Russia was excommunicated. So they, they produced a kind of a dot matrix printer that, that sort of drove along 
and sprayed the tweets of their members on, on the road until uh, they were pulled over and compelled not to. So this is the where coming from the who. Another campaign, this is from 2008, uh, from Get London Reading, uh, another street campaign, uh, sp spray painting uh, quotes from famous texts, usually about the neighborhood. This was a book about Brick Lane, spray painted in Brick Lane, to try to generate interest in the library, try to get, get people reading, try to get people thinking about books. Very low cost, very low tech. They probably already had the boxes. And so these offline actions filter back into online. I know we spend a lot of time, the library plan, talking about digitization. It's always fun when you go back the other way, putting things into the real world from the electronic, which then gets captured on, on film, on uh, photos rather. Uh, nobody uses film anymore. Uh, uh, captured digitally and then recirculated back through social media. So you have this wonderful cycle. So you want to capture their attention offline as well as online. So going back to our where, what devices are they using? 90% of US adults have cell phones. This is astonishing. But only 58% of them have smartphones. And teens? Initially, as, as, as Facebook was becoming popular, I heard like, oh, the kids these days, they're not using the email anymore. They're on the Facebook. Well, now it's, we're, we're past, that was like yesterday. Now it's, oh, they're on Snapchat. Facebook is, is done. Um, but through it all, uh, teens are texting. And there are lots of wonderful online tools for setting up text messages. If your program is working with teens, one way to reach them is through text, especially during class. <laughs> so this is an organization, do something that, or that is a, another advocacy group. They work with uh, youth around the US and they have a massive network of this two and a half million, well over a million of them are, are on text. And they send them every two weeks, they send them a text message encouraging them to take an action, inviting them to participate in the campaign, um, and then to text them back with feedback. Uh, and uh, it's, it's huge, been hugely successful for them. And the same tools that this organization is using are available to all of you. So tools. That's enough sort of abstract, pie-in-the-sky talk. How do we get this done? Here are my top 10 tips for you. Because number, number 10, everyone loves lists. And by lists, I don't mean 14 cats who think they're sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Although well, that is good. It, it is good, and there's something to be learned here. I'll, I'll leave that as a, for the reader. Uh, um, but people like to scan their content. And not, I'm not saying everything you produce should be in list form, uh, but, but the idea is people don't read online top to bottom. This is a, the results of an eye tracking study. This is one of the, uh, eye tracking is one of the tools used for usability testing. As you, you follow the eyes, you set up a, a little camera um, and follow the eye as the user is reading through the page. Um, what catches their eye? So here, if they read the first paragraph, they sort of started out in the right place. And they started to wander a little bit, and oh, who's this guy? And you know, what's over in the right-hand margin? And um, one thing to note is that they're, they're, they're looking at the links. Mm. They're not reading the text around it, so that's interesting. But the idea here is to make your text short and chunky very easy to scan, and very easy to share. So tip number nine, emotion. People share things that make them happy, make them excited, and make them outraged. You think about something that people, uh, someone has shared with you, um, some, something that they thought was inspiring, uh, or, or hugely shameful. Um, for instance, my, my father sends me things that sort of funny, uh, funny emails. This is a part of his relationship with me. He communicates uh, his love through these kind of funny email shares. And delight. The, the artist uh, Jerthorpe has this wonderful uh, expression. He wants to try to 
you want to capture people's attention with the ooh and then draw them into the ah, pull them in, entice them into the understanding. Well, here's a wonderful uh, example. This is a, a new facade going up in, in Kansas City. Uh, apologies for the orange cones. It's not open yet. Um, so, so you see that I heard I heard some oohs out there. So it's <laughs> you see this big facade. It's impressive. It's huge. It's giant books. Uh, but then you start to read the titles, Catch-22, Fahrenheit 451, mm -hmm. Silent Spring. These are pretty subversive, important books to be uh, broadcasting this bit. So I think there, there's, uh, this speaks to, I think, other interesting questions this library is, uh, is, is putting out there. Which brings me to number eight, humor. Related to the previous point. People like delight. And humor is a good way of, of uh, punching, punching through skepticism. Um, if, if, particularly in the campaigning context, if you're trying to motivate your supporters or trying to uh, break through to the other side, if you can crack a smile, you've got them. You're halfway there. Um, humor is a good way of disarming. Uh, and people like humor. People like to laugh. You are familiar with memes. These are some... Uh, Choice library memes. <laughs> they're, they're, they're images with type laid on them. <laughs> Here's our friend, uh, Philosopher Raptor, again. So memes, they're funny, they're snarky, there's these sort of little bite sized uh, visual nuggets, and they're you know, fairly disposable, um, but this makes them incredibly powerful. People are sharing these things around amongst each other. Um, they're connecting with each other, each other through these things. Uh, another uh, project out of Kansas City, this is a, a series of library trucks uh, done up by an ad agency uh, to promote fictitious businesses. Kansas City is a very big, flat place. Um, and so these library trucks are out there on the road. This Kafka's Pest Control. <laughs> and this was a nice, innovative approach, and it gives the impression of the library as kind of a fun, innovative place to be. And they're clever. Benjamin Button's diaper service. <laughs> Dr. Jekyll's Pharmacy. And these were passed around on social media. They're funny and they're clever, they're very well crafted, and they already had the trucks anyway. <coughs> These things went viral. When people pass them to each other, and it keeps going around and around and around, but it, they didn't just put this online and then suddenly someone noticed and it started to spread. They sent out a press release. And very often when you see these sort of viral phenomena, there's usually some other, uh, other kind of kickstart to it. Which brings me to point seven, images. Does anyone uh, anyone here remember Gopher? Gopher sites? Yeah. I'm still programming it. Yeah, long live the Gopher. Uh, so the web has come a long way in, in 25 years from being a, a strictly text medium through the uh, Gopher interfaces, um, through blogs where you had to, some of my early client work, we had to keep our, our, our the entire page load under 35K, including images. Nowadays, it's, it's uh, you know, just one minified JavaScript library alone can surpass that. Um, so uh, the internet has evolved from, from purely text <coughs> blogs, you can see sort of schematic of Facebook and Twitter, and now you have social media networks that are entirely visual. Your Instagram, your Vine, your Pinterest, um, Secret is the, one of the latest ones, Door of Secret. It, it's a way of, uh, it's, it's an anonymous social network, you, you sign up, you plug into your, your network and then you can post uh, snarky things or, or confessions. Um, nobody has to see who it came from. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Snapchat too is also very highly visual, uh, for better or worse. Uh, Tumblr, also a, a blogging platform, but people use it a lot for visuals. Um, and this has happened uh, in part because of uh, the technology, the software has grown to embrace visuals. Computers have gotten a little faster. The bandwidth has uh, improved, uh, particularly on our, our phones. 
And also our devices have cameras in them. It may not, it may not look like, like this guy clearly loves his cat. Some bad's gonna happen. Yeah. And so, you know, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit of, you have to look to find a new cell phone that doesn't have a camera, if that's what, it's, that's, that's important to you. Um, so there's more pictures everywhere. And I say this, so uh, full, full disclosure, I'm a recovering art student. Um, but pictures work because they're emotional, uh, and they're memorable, and they're shareable. And there's do this documented phenomenon called the picture superiority effect. Uh, and I say this not just uh, as a designer, uh, but you can look it up at the reference desk. This is a, a tested phenomenon. If you hear information, purely in words, three days later, you may remember about 10% but if you use words and a picture, three days later you'll remember 65%. So a significant part of our, 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 of our bodies, of our brains, is devoted to vision. And if you want to grab people's attention, um, you also want to have your image, uh, your message remembered. You want it to stick. And there's also, of course, video. And many of you, you already have your library programs. How many of you are videotaping these and putting these online? Movie maker. <laughs> Number six, so listen to your audience. So here is a, a picture of a room full of people sitting very politely, uh, all together at the same time in the same room. They're all fairly well-to-do, you know, fairly well-dressed. Try not to think of this picture when you think of social media. Social media is the opposite of this. It's everything that's happening at the same time. People are not just sitting passively, but they're also broadcasting. They're broadcasting what they're reading, they're sharing, they're replying, they're liking. Um, it's not just two way, but it's every which way. So how do you use this to listen? You can look for keywords. Uh, Google is one way to do this uh, through search. You can also use uh, searches built into the various social media uh, sites. You can look at what people are connecting to and what their, start to look at what their influences are. Who are their allies <coughs> online? These are a couple of tools uh, that, that I use for, for Twitter, but there are, there are many, many tools for, for searching and analyzing uh, social media activity online. This is one uh, output from uh, ThinkUp, sort of showing what the response is to the various follow to Gina's various followers. And you can listen offline as well. You can observe how are people using social media, how are people using your libraries and your programs. You can ask them, you can survey them. Though I'm talking to you mostly about social media, I want to keep it a little bit in the broader context of outreach as well. So five, participation. Don't be that guy at the party that's only talking about themselves. You know, once, once you set up your social media account, don't just be continually uh, promoting your, your, your next activity, you want to be able to engage in a conversation. Um, you can respond to people and also seek out what people are doing. You can follow them, you can ask them, ask them questions, ask, solicit their feedback, ask them to take actions. I've heard a lot about hashtags. So most of you are probably familiar with this. Uh, but if not, the hashtags are the sort of canned searches uh, used to find messages on a specific topic. Um, and these have been, there have been some really interesting advocacy campaigns that have emerged from this quite organically. There's uh, the Not Buying It campaign. Has anyone heard of this? Right, so during, <clears throat> during a major media event like the Oscars or the Super Bowl, anytime an ad runs that's particularly uh, disgusting, particularly sexist or racist, people immediately take to social media and are commenting about it with this hashtag. Advertisers are taking notice. All of a sudden, there's this dynamic feedback. This is something, this, this popped up uh, just in the last two weeks. No makeup selfies. So uh, the Oscars were a few weeks ago. Someone noticed uh, there was a discussion online about uh, Kim Novak, Kim Novak from Vertigo. Uh, her, her appearance at the Oscars. People criticized her for not being all dolled up. 
So uh, people were kind of outraged at this response. So in, in turn responded by posting pictures of themselves, not all dolled up, using no makeup selfies. Um, and this primarily in the UK, this, this caught fire. Uh, and at some point, someone linked this action to a uh, breast cancer charity. And all of a sudden, the breast cancer charities were starting to get tons of donations. Like, oh, oh, what's happening? This is great. Uh, so the, one charity raised two million pounds uh, quite quickly without, without really uh, soliciting this at all. It's very organic, very grassroots. So, so how, could you, how could libraries take advantage of this? Well, these things are happening all the time. If you see the trending list on Twitter, uh, you can see the hashtags there. One recent one was uh, film prequels. So these are sort of fictitious uh, films. Um, Film people. So, for instance, uh, Prince Kong. Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, dude, where's the Red October? <laughs> or what, my favorite, uh, Memento 2. <laughs> so, so how can a library take advantage of this? Well, how about um, the girl who was researching dragons at the library? <laughs> I had one more. Oh, yes. Looking into musicals at the high school library. <laughs> so here's our friend Jamie Oliver again, uh, his, his current Twitter profile. So I want to call attention not to the delicious Jamie Dodgers, sorry Andy, but to the, uh, the 3.8 million followers he has. Celebrities have a huge, huge following online because people feel this direct connection. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you all go and harass Jamie Oliver, to let, let them know about your programs. Um, but one of the ways that people can connect, one of the ways you can find your audience is to tap into existing networks. So this is social media, but it's also email lists, radio, television, schools, clubs, associations, organizations. You know, this all comes out of what networks you should use depends on the who of your target audience. Maybe your audience isn't on social media. Maybe they're playing Mahjong in the park, that same park every Saturday. If you have a program for that audience, you better go to that park. And you can partner with these organizations. Point number four, connect. So it's not just enough to let people know about what your programs are, but also about your social media presence. Don't just pass around the sign-up sheet at the end, uh, trying to get everyone's email list and social network address. You want to try to present it at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end. I've been way to way too many meetings of small nonprofits where everyone has one foot out the door. Oh, wait, 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 everyone sign up to the mailing list. That ends now. <laughs> Don't do it. Let people know. And at the same time, it's, not, it's important not just to add your, your, your social media network address at the bottom of your station or your Real small. Here's, here's your poster, and there's your connect to us on Facebook. No, let people know. Circulate it. This is where people are, are talking. This is where people are congregating. You definitely want to have the compelling content, but you also want to entice them. You want to express the value of your programs, but you want to connect it to the values of your audience. The so one way to do that: more flirty in libraries with apologies to the high school and college librarians who may have too much flirting in the libraries. <laughs> and I don't necessarily mean as, you know, singles night at the library. Uh, <laughs> although, that is a usually untapped sustainable resource. You want to try to approach them, uh, not just the facts, but to try to establish a connection. You want to try to tease your audience a little bit. You want to play with them. You want to have to be, uh, be personal, like we saw our, our the photos of the librarians on the, the side of the Twitter uh, page this morning. I want to make your users feel special and valued. Point three, amplify. People are already online, people are already on social media sharing what they love. For instance, baseball. Any baseball fans? A few. Yeah. The people that love baseball are going to talk about baseball. They're going to talk about it online. They're going to talk about it offline. And this is great marketing for Major League Baseball. 
They're also going to be sharing online. This is great for the communications department, not so great for the legal department. Because of this. And this. So what do you do? Whatever you do, don't do this. Don't, don't sue your fan. I, I don't have an MBA, I admit. But this strikes me as bad business. You don't want to punish the people who are buying your tickets, who are paying your bills. So what can you do if you're Major League Baseball? Well, invite them to join you. So Major League Baseball has, invites its fans, particularly its super fans, to start blogs. So they're blogging on MLBblogs.com. Anyone can start a free blog, and it's, it's free traffic for Major League Baseball. They see what people are posting. They can connect it to other networks uh, and to themselves. You want to create together with your audience. And some of you are probably already doing this. Uh, another wonderful example, this was a, a writer uh, who tweeted uh, one day, I wish I could get a residency on Amtrak. Wouldn't it be so much fun just to write and watch the countryside roll by? Amtrak noticed this. They said, why, yes. Look, she writes for the New York Times and Ted in the Paris Review. Why don't you come have a residency on Amtrak? And so now it's a thing. You can apply for a residency on Amtrak. Any, any, uh, any writer, I think the applications are closing soon, if you're interested. Uh, and it's, you get a, a free round trip ticket, uh, long distance, uh, and a free sleeping car. And so Amtrak gets the goodwill and the publicity and um, probably the right to use some of the content. Um, and so it's a wonderful way of, of co-creating. <laughs> so I mentioned museums. Most museums ask you not to take pictures of the objects, particularly flash pictures. But they're doing it anyway. You're, you're, uh, the people attending museums are doing it. So the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art used this to their advantage, and they created an ad campaign by looking at people, interesting pictures on, uh, on Flickr and building a, 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 an offline campaign around this. <laughs> you're, they're very funny, and they're very human. She's looking right at the camera. And it puts these you know, otherwise mysterious objects into an interesting context. This is one of my favorites. 19th century wing. So how can you do this at the library? People taking pictures of themselves at the library. People taking pictures of things they love. People taking pictures of things that they wish they could do. Um, there have been a number of selfie campaigns. We saw the no makeup selfies. Um, the we are the 99% Tumblr was another big one. This is, a, I think my friend Sasha sums this up quite concisely. Instead of thinking of a target audience, work directly to make media with the folks you want to reach. Because the odds are they will share that with people in their network, who will share it within their network, et cetera, et cetera. Point number two, measure. In a nutshell, this is working. You're investing in social media, you're investing in outreach. Is it working? How do you know? Well, you can look at your analytics. Many of you are uh, maybe using Google Analytics or other ways of measuring your traffic, your web traffic. Um, you can see what are people coming in, what keywords are they using, uh, what networks are they coming in from, what are their traffic patterns. There's a logic here. Maybe invisible to the naked eye, but there's definitely a logic to these, uh, these individuals circling around. Look at your followers, look at the retweets, look at the comments. You want to try to take this, look at not just the quantitative data, but try to interpret, interpret qualitatively. What are people saying? What are people doing? How can you learn from this? What are they commenting on? How can you interpret the findings? What does it mean? And you can do this offline as well. If we heard our, our, our survey results, uh, the gentleman responsible for the, the measurement and survey this morning. This is how we learn, how we improve. We ask our audience, if you want to get really advanced, there's A-B testing. So this comes from, uh, I heard about this first in direct mail. So you have a big enough direct mail list, you send some out with a sticker, 
and some with the pen, and then you kind of see which has a better response rate. Okay, well the sticker's doing better than the pen, so we drop the pen. Now everyone gets the sticker, we're gonna change the paper stock. Some get the yellow paper, some get the white paper. You can do this infinitely, but tweaking the variables, tweaking the messages, you can do this online as well. You make two home pages that come up randomly. One has the puppy, one has the kitten. Which does better? Or put, put the banner at the top, put the banner at the bottom. This is advanced stuff. Um, but you, if you start to get enough traffic, you can start to draw conclusions from this. And this is a way of improving your website, testing your theories about the design, about what people are looking at. Question, sir? Yeah. And finally, experiment. Try different networks. Try different ideas. Try different methods. What you say is as important as how you say it. Again, I, I repeat, what you say and how you say it are two different things. There's a social network called, a, not a social network, a, a site called Upworthy that produces content. Really, they're more of a curator. I don't know if they produce their own stuff. Um, the stuff they, they curate gets spread around very, very widely, particularly on Facebook. Um, and when, when they write their headlines, they, they, they've been very open about their, their, the way that they work. Um, they, they'll, they'll draft maybe 10, sometimes 20, sometimes 30 variations of a headline before they put it out there. And sometimes they'll test the variations too to see how they do. So try on a different persona as you're experimenting. What would, what would the voice of the library say? Uh, what would the voice of Abraham Lincoln say? Um, people respond to novelty, but novelty is metabolized very quickly. You can't try. You can't tell the same joke to the same person over and over and over. It works maybe once, maybe twice. And that's it. And important, you ought to have fun with it. Experimenting is important for you as well. You want to be a little bit playful with it. You want to grow. Experimentation is how we grow. Making mistakes is how we grow and how we learn. That's a quote from Mr. Joyce. Mistakes are the portals of discovery. We heard something like this this morning. <coughs> And with social media, it's very easy to start small and respond quickly. If it works, great. If it doesn't, shut it down. Social media is very disposable. Um, or one of the things that's so wonderful about iLead is that you can then you can take the big swing. You can take the big experiment. Hey, John. Yes, sir. Sorry to start small on you, but I think you might just turn it off. Or oh. something. I think the battery died. Uh-oh. We have a backup. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Better? All right. I'm almost done. Uh, so, for example, uh, we, a couple of folks that here are working have GED programs to promote. So in addition to broadcasting the location and time of your program, um, there's the why of it. Why would people want to take the GED? And not just to get a better job or... Uh, to, to uh, level up. But one of the things you can do instead of just the location and time broadcast a success story uh, or greetings from the future. You know, be playful with it. Hello. Remember that time you... Oh, I can't tell you the spoiler, but don't forget to take the GED. <laughs> uh, and number three, so the social media is made of robots, it's made of people, Social media is also made of time. It's always on, for better and for worse. So social media is powered very much by this cognitive surplus we heard about a little bit this morning. It's the people, it's the people standing in line or bored at work, checking their Facebook, checking the Twitter on their phones, uh, in meetings, perhaps in presentations. I see. I see. Uh, it's these little cracks in time filled by social media, the cracks have begun to expand uh, and are eating time itself, um, to borrow from Doctor Who. And speaking of which, so uh, time, our past, present, and future, we can look at these uh, through the lens of social media. You can look back, you can measure, you can search, you can mine the archives, see what is working, what are people saying. You can evaluate uh, these search results. You can look around you, social media is in real time. You can see what topics are trending. Uh, this is one 
kind of remarkable, very simple, you know, sort of a stock photo of a cookie with a radial gradient. Um, during the Super Bowl, there was a, last year or the year before, there was a, a blackout during which Oreo, someone at Oreo posted this uh, on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it was hugely popular, 15, nearly 16,000 retweets for a fairly simple ad. This definitely caught people's attention um, in probably the, the people, the, the shoe company is shelling out millions of dollars for some cool spots, we're a little bit jealous of the success. So we're looking back, we're looking around, we can also look ahead with social media. Start to have a plan, a strategy, uh, looking forward uh, to what kind of events are coming up, not just in the next week or the next month, but around, of course, uh, the span of the whole year. What kind of social media campaigns can you devise in advance? What kind of hooks are coming up, for instance, Valentine's Day or uh, another kind of holiday? What, what kind of hook uh, can you event? What special dates are coming up of cultural significance? Um, if people respond to things that are familiar. For instance, if, if you're in Jamaica and you hear a song uh, that comes on that you're familiar with, but oh, they're doing it in a reggae style, it's a little bit different, well, of course, you're going to go on stage. Because you, you capture people's attention uh, with things that are familiar. And the time to plan for <laughs> sorry, <buddy. laughs> the time to plan for an emergency is not during the emergency itself. You want to plan in advance. What is your social media strategy? What does your editorial calendar look like? And of course, let the old media know. The press loves uh, the quirky social media stories. Um, and especially if you're building something visual, it's, it's, a, it's, a nice, uh, it's a nice piece for them to put on their, on their site as well. So you want to try to carve out time for your social media. Um, network building can be very slow. Sometimes, surprisingly, it's very quick. But it takes a long time to build up a large number of followers. You want to be able to set the stage uh, for your outreach and for your activities online. And for social media updates to be not one more thing. Everybody here is very, very busy. They have too much to do as it is. You want to try to integrate it into your work. Um, how can you uh, make it part of your daily routine um, every day, or at least your weekly routine? How can you build it to, into the culture of your organization and into your communication strategy? Not just online, but offline as well. What are the touch points of your organization? This is marketing speak um, for places where your brand or your organization comes into contact with your audience, or, or the other way around. Um, and not just at the physical location, but online as well, from their friends. How are people hearing about your organization? And so finally, how do you get there? How do you pull social media in? How do you make it a part of your work? Um, what is your stepping back from the, the limits of time, from the limits of vision while we're here, away from the daily grind? What is your vision for an ideal social media program? How can you a, a imagine what it might look like? And then from there, what resources might you need to get there? What tactics can you use to get there? And I will end uh, with an anecdote of sorts. This is a produced by my daughter. This is a parable of, of who. This is uh, Ella's Rainbow Shapes. Uh, my daughter is five and produced this uh, for me to show to you. Uh, she is very talented <laughs> at, at wow. many things. Uh, and, and her strategy with this piece was very old world, old media. She wanted to pr produce this book so she could insert it into the library herself. So using guerrilla marketing, using visuals, to insert her message into the, the common circulation. So Ella's Rainbow Shapes. Green is the diamond. Purple is the square. Red is the triangle. Blue is the rectangle. But here's, there's a twist ending. There always is. Yeah. So this is, this is not just about geometry and color, but these are characters. And the idea is that in all of us, there is a secret rainbow shape. This is a story of who. 
And as you try to reach your target audience, consider the secret rainbow shape inside. And don't just notify them about what your organization is doing, but try to establish a connection. Try to let that rainbow shape shine. Parting words? Thank you. Questions? someone come in and talk about those these old things and you know sort of build programming around that um, you know one of the things I, I didn't say here was that you you don't have to have just the one Facebook channel um, you know particularly if, if your if your target audience to speak different languages you can set up one, more than one um, you can set up another channel targeting other audiences I was going to show you this when it's over, but it would answer her question. There's an Ohio library doing shelfies. When a, when a holiday comes up, they're, they're taking a photo of the bookshelf to do with that holiday or that whatever, and yeah. they're posting it on media. Great, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm in a K-5 library, and I think more in terms of, of course, the older kids that work with the creators and this type of dialogue or communication as well as my parents. And I'm thinking in terms of the idea of moderating or you know monitoring what's going on or you know where do you draw lines, do you draw lines, how do you yeah, deal that's, with that in that kind of setting? Community management is hard and, yeah. and time consuming and and uh, as your community starts as your online community starts to grow, like you have to pay attention that someone has to, um, and that your, your, your community is only as, as vibrant as its moderation is. Um, the internet trolls are, are, are kind of angry, outrageous people uh, online are, are a part of what's out there. And it's, there. People have devised a number, are, are continuing to improve upon a number of technical solutions to this, but it's, people are always going to help smart the robots. Uh, so like if you're doing a Facebook group, do you have like a closed group? Would that be like something you would suggest just so it's like within my school and yeah. monitoring like who wants to be a member or a client? It, it depends on your audience. I mean that, that may well, my, my mother runs a closed uh, Facebook group for um, her, her Red Hat Society walking club. Um, <laughs> You know, women of a certain age who go out and trip to be fit and fabulous, and um, so you know, th there, there's that little bit. It, one advantage is that it keeps out the trolls, um, and uh, the other advantage is that there's a little bit of cachet to being part of this kind of closed group. Um, so that's you know, the, the disadvantage is that it's less discoverable. Last question, alas. Okay. No, I mean. Oh, okay. I was just going to say I have some suggestions for you. Okay. Okay. Um, a lot of the tools people use for social media are the corporate tools, and I've heard a lot about Facebook changing their yeah. you know, algorithm to make money for themselves. Yeah. It seems yeah. reasonable for corporations. But how would you kind of balance? The corporate interests of these tools that we seem like we have to use. Yeah, well, there's that's a hard one. I mean, there, there have been a number of attempts to create alternatives, like sort of free software, and there are there's wonderful software that you can use to create sort of closed groups or private groups or entirely your own. Um, the the downside is, is that is that people are on Facebook already, um, and and very much. I mean, there's the there's the saying that if, if the product is sorry, if the service is free, the product is you. 
Mm-hmm. It's kind of what goes around, and that's that's the reality of it, um, and that's that's a you know that's a cost of using it, um, and especially where where K fives are concerned, this is you know one has to be quite sensitive to this, um, you know, and especially the, the NSA is snooping everyone's metadata, and, you know, even Facebook you know, capitalizing on. That. To say. So uh, again, I think it comes back to who and, and sort of who are you trying to reach and where are they? And can you invite everyone to, to your own network? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.